Good evening and welcome to this uh, wonderful conversation. We're delighted to have Mr. Rajesh Demla with us. Uh, Mr. Rajesh, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for sparing this time with us. We are looking forward to listening to you on gamification in e-commerce and what are the opportunities and uh, challenges that we can look at. So uh, what I will do is I will do a brief introduction and then hand it over back to you so that you can start your opening remarks. Uh, let me share my screen right away. This is called Wise Views uh, Leadership Conversations, which we host every Friday, Friday evenings. Gamification and e-commerce opportunities and challenges. The first 20, uh, including the uh, introduction, it will be 30 minutes that the talk of Rajesh uh, will be part of the first 30 minutes. And the next 30 minutes is the Q&A moderated by Professor Prasad and myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Mr. Rajesh for you the founder of bitzap.in. The portfolio of companies uh, include startups in e-commerce, quick commerce, hyperlocal, logistics, fintech, food tech, gaming, which cover geographies around the world. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur and uh, Mr. Rajesh is also a firm believer in the Indian startup ecosystem and is always keen to engage with youngsters in their journey to achieve their dreams. Mr. Rajesh comes from extremely humble beginnings and is a He's a completely self-made man and he's admirable for the kind of achievement uh, that uh, he has been able to make over the years. Mr. Rajesh has the rare distinction of having played a crucial role in three companies, helping them go public in the last nine years. Uh, he is a recipient of several awards in India, Singapore and London. He has been felicitated by the Economic Times, Times of India, WRCC International, Brand Vision, so on and so forth. Mr. Rajesh loves to live the good life and is an ardent travel and driving enthusiast. He has driven various cars in four continents on all kinds of terrains like frozen rivers, glaciers, volcanic mountains, and on flowing rivers as well. This is something extremely interesting. However, that will not be part of the uh, topic that we are talking today, but it's an extremely interesting profile that we have. Uh, I, I also take uh, one moment to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Prasad, he is the professor and course mentor for the online MBA program. Otherwise, he is the director at uh, Academic Wing in the ICFI group. He's, he has 30 years of rich experience uh, spanning across entrepreneurship, corporate life, as well as academics. He's a PGDM uh, from IIM Kolkata and BTEC from IIT Bombay. Uh, he has published several journal articles, edited various books, and presented papers in various conferences, both national and international. Welcome, uh, uh, Professor Prasad, and welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Rajesh. Uh, I'll now close my uh, screen and I hand it over back to you, Rajesh. Once again, thank you very much, and please start your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Sudhakar, and uh, you know, thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, it's always it's always a pleasure interacting with uh, you know uh, the industry folks. Uh, there is a lot more to learn than to give. Uh, as my experiences. So I'm looking forward to this as well. Um, looking forward to the Q&A. Um, so before we get there, if we can, uh, I, I, would, I would like to start off uh, with the presentation. Uh, if the team can just share the slide, uh, uh, Sudhakar, that will help. Yes, yes, it's on. Great, great. See, uh, the, the whole idea of the next 20, 25 minutes that I'm going to speak is, uh, uh, this is not the first slide, by the way, if you can go to the first slide. Um, yeah. Thank you. So if, if you know, uh, the topic that I'm speaking about today is not a topic that can be covered in 20 minutes or 20 or 30 minutes, it can't even be covered in 20 days. Okay, the whole world is learning uh, what can be done. Uh, and if you speak to 10 people in the industry, they will have 10 different views, I'm going to present my view and my experiences. So uh, if it makes sense, it uh, is great. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, what I'm talking about is the gamification in e-commerce and what are we doing with uh, gamification with an e-commerce industry. Uh, before I get to that, I would just like to talk about the landscape, the Indian landscape today. If you can go to the next slide. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the Indian landscape, today we have about close to 900 million uh, mobile phone users, okay, close to about 300 million uh, people who have done digital transactions, uh, so on and so forth. You know, we all, everybody who's on this uh, 
um, a webinar knows what the Indian landscape looks like. So I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, however, I would like to, uh, you know, talk about 80% of the people in India who have, uh, you know, access to a device and the and, and internet have done the following. Either they are, they, they've adapted a game or they have bought a product online. Now that is a data that is staggering and an opportunity that is like an ocean. Imagine 80% of all people in India are either playing games or buying something. And that is the reality out there today. What does that mean? If we club the two, can we gamify e-commerce? And is there a need to gamify e-commerce? I'm going to talk about it. The numbers are irrelevant. These numbers, I don't know whether they are really genuine or not. 4.5 million sellers who have uh, you know, registered as an online seller. Uh, personally, I don't think that these are numbers that have uh, come out of IBEF, but uh, I don't personally believe they're active. I don't even think there are a million sellers who are actively selling uh, in India today. That's my personal guess. Um, 70 million daily real-time transactions happening uh, in a country like India um, with about 45% uh, share of digital wallets and about uh, 12 crore, that's about 120 million UPI users in the country. That's the landscape just to let you know that how big is the market. Now let's go back to the topic and see is gamification required in e-commerce or not. So to understand that we'll have to look at what are the problems and challenges, right? Uh, let's, so, so the e-commerce industry is seeing several challenges, several problems. Um, let's look at the next slide. So the biggest uh, problem that everybody is facing is customer acquisition cost. It's not easy to acquire customers. It's a very expensive affair. And even when you acquire a customer, your lifetime value of that customer, what was anticipated and what you actually get, there is a huge gap. You know why? Because customers are driven by price. Their loyalty remains only with the price. So even if you've acquired a customer, it means nothing because if a competition is going to come and uh, sell the same product at a lower price, your customer is gone. Okay, you are left fighting for it. Okay, uh, the other problem for sellers in the country is the monopoly of some large platforms. A few la large platforms in the country today, without naming any, the challenges with large uh, platforms is that listing is difficult, um, selling is even more difficult. Why? because they have um, stringent listing policies, um, return policies, and competition uh, is immense because everybody is allowed to sell on those platforms. So you're lost in an ocean. And if you want to be discovered, then the cost of being discovered is insane. You know, uh, So after the cost of discovery returns and the uh, platform fees and commissions, I don't even know if sellers are making money and which is why majority of the sellers are dropping out of such large platforms today. Um, and there is an emerging trend which is extremely interesting for all of us to watch out. Uh, so the other challenge is privacy and targeting when, uh, you know, apart from these three or four large e-commerce platforms, a lot of the sellers are going direct on Facebook, Google, Insta, et cetera, and trying to sell their products. Uh, the challenge is there is privacy and targeting. Again, the same issues, very, very expensive to acquire a customer and uh, very difficult to actually uh, drive a sale out of that customer. Even if you do all of that, you know, for a small seller or for a medium sized seller, managing technology is a nightmare. Okay. And, um, you know, the free versus paid customer that is basically a lot of companies, whether it is small, medium or big, are trying to acquire customers by giving freebies. Okay. But at a time when they're, when it's free, the customer comes to them. The moment they start charging, the customer runs away. So converting a free customer to a paid customer is almost impossible. These are the challenges. Okay. And these are some of the challenges that I know. If you talk to more people, you will find a lot more problems out there. So what do we do? How do we, uh, you know, uh, manage this? If we are a seller in this country, and if you want to run a business that has to be uh, omni-channel, then what do you do with it? What are the, so, so let's look at what are the demands of new India out there, right? 
So our experience, okay, now everything that I'm speaking is coming from our own experience. And, uh, you know, that is why some of it is going to be sounding uh, maybe it's sometimes difficult to uh, digest if you're not in the e-commerce space. So let's look at the next slide. So the demands of New India is every consumer in India wants convenience. Basically, you know, everybody has gotten used to a certain magic and everybody wants magic. I want to buy a product. I should find it right now, right here, sitting on my desk, on my phone. And I should be able to place an order. And, you know, before I reach home, the product should reach home. The convenience that I want to buy all of this. And the best part is I don't want to pay logistics fees. I don't want to pay any additional charges, but I want it to be delivered in a couple of hours at the lowest price in the world. You know, that's the Indian consumer mindset we have seen largely. So the Indian consumer wants everything, but does not really want to pay value for it, right? Um, and today, uh, when we look at Omni-channel. What do we mean? Uh, what do we mean by omni-channel today? The meaning itself has changed. If you are offline selling a product, for you, omni-channel could only mean today that uh, it's not purely online, but social commerce, right? So when you say social commerce, basically, I know people who are buying products on Instagram. They don't even want to go to the uh, platform or a you know or a, or a, a, a store. They are on Insta, they want to buy it on Insta, they're done with it. The other thing that the consumer demands is a frictionless experience. So the moment your buying experience takes more than two or three minutes or five minutes, even two, three minutes, actually a lot, okay? Uh, or if there are too many steps involved, or if there are too many, you know, uh, forms or trivia or anything that, you know, the platform is trying to capture data, the consumer is gone. The consumer is not interested. Flexible payment options, the, you know, emergence of buy now, pay later, um, you know, the recent RBI regulation that has now allowed, uh, you know, mandates on UPI is going to make it even better. But every consumer expects that if I am buying something even worth 5,000 rupees or 2,000 rupees, allow me to convert it into uh, EMIs and pay slowly when, at my convenience. So that's the demand of the country. And lastly, delivery convenience, you know, people want everything delivered uh, to their uh, homes or offices, but in real quick time. That's the consumer's demand today, right? So cost of acquisition is high and being discovered for a seller, I'm talking about from a seller's point of view, cost of acquisition is extremely high. Getting discovered is expensive getting listed is a problem. And then once you do all of that and you find the consumer coming to you, your consumer is expecting all of these things. That is the e-commerce landscape, right? When we looked at it as a team, we said, how can we make e-commerce more meaningful? Because it's not a meaningful thing. Even today there are, without naming again, there are very, very large e-commerce players in the country that are not making money. They're losing money. If they're still burning money, right? Now, how, what's going to happen next and what can we do uh, was the question that we were trying to answer and then we moved on. Uh, please go on to the next slide if you don't mind. So what we saw is we said, okay, let's look at what's happening in the country apart from the regular, uh, you know, e-commerce sales that are happening. We saw a wave of B2C brands emerging. Okay. What accelerated it? COVID accelerated it. Now, direct to consumer brands you know, have suddenly become very meaningful. Okay, there are uh, there are no middlemen, uh, you know, in most cases, uh, or very little, uh, you know, middlemen in the in the whole D2C business. So we have seen a lot of D2C brands uh, emerging in the last few, uh, you know, couple of years. So let's look at the next slide. Okay, so what is it that they offer? Okay, they are offering a larger bouquet of choices. Until now, you knew certain brands. Say, for example, just let's take cosmetics, right? Cosmetics earlier was what? About four or five brands, and most of them were either international brands or in India, it was Lakme. Uh, you know, you had, uh, if it was international brands, you had Mac and Bobby Brown and, you know, so on and so forth. Today, when you look at the cosmetic market, all of a sudden you see Indian brands like Wow, Sugar, so on and so forth. And these brands have not just come in, they have been, they have taken the market by storm. 
some of their some of their gmbs uh, are in the range of about 100 million to 100 million dollars uh, already in a year and uh, their valuations many of them are unicorns um the good part is some of them are even profitable right now that for me is a real uh, take away how can you be profitable in e-commerce and that is something the d2c brands have been able to show uh, many of the brands have also been able to give experience the product before buying even online i'm not a big fan of it from a seller's point of view but from a buyer's point of view it's an amazing uh, option because i can order something get it home try it if i like it i buy it if i don't like it i send it back okay while it's great for a consumer and it's good for a new brand okay because they are able to give the consumer an experience to try it personally i think in the long term it's a loss making proposition uh data has to show it's too early to talk about it data will show whether it's going to make sense or not we will see that right uh personalization through ai and ml is another thing that the d2c brands have been uh extremely good with so basically it's it's another form of retargeting um so let's say for example if there is a consumer who likes a particular design um in uh, you know of a nike or an asics or a you know particular uh sneaker uh, a new brand a d2c brand which is selling similar shoes at 1/4 or you know or even lesser the price is able to personalize and show the consumer designs which are more likely to be liked by that that consumer so that is something that's happening in the d2c business and accessibility over visibility basically today uh, what what's been seen is that uh, earlier there was a saying in hindi jo dikhta hai wo bikta hai today that is uh, what is accessible to you on your phone is what is going to sell right so basically what it means is if you are a d2c brand uh, you must make yourself accessible on everybody's phone when that person is ready and uh, that's what we have seen as a wave in the last since can we move to the next slide in the last couple of years that's the wave uh, i'm not going to delve on this too much uh, very quickly there are some changes in the regulations in e-commerce which i need to talk about which will change the ecosystem quite a lot uh for example gst uh you know the indian government has allowed non gst sellers to be listed on marketplaces and sell it's not from this year uh, my to the many of you are much better informed than me about this um so i'm not going to make a fool of myself talking about it i think it's from january 2023 um you know that's but it's a it's a game changer why is it a game changer because a lot of these guys have not been able to sell and therefore there has been monopoly of certain companies or certain large e-commerce portals selling only uh, you know products that were allowed to be sold by manufacturers or distributors come 2023 we are going to see a completely new uh, you know trend in e-commerce there are going to be extremely small players selling very valuable products at very low cost okay and most of these will set up their own shops uh, and get discovered uh, you know they will not generally sell on large marketplaces uh, that's my guess and that's what we are uh, enabling them to do um, you know there are about 50 plus 50 million plus msmes that will come uh, uh, you know and start selling over the next 24 months and that's a huge opportunity for anybody who is uh, playing a support role uh, for this ecosystem a uh, 100% fdi for b2b e-commerce uh, very good extremely good uh, you know will mean a lot more money coming into the system uh, and uh, inclusivity uh, the crux of the opportunity is basically digitizing rural sellers there are companies like oneverse um, which was which is earlier it was called onebridge um, you know there are companies that are targeting rural india and trying to take uh, aspirational products to rural india because they believe their affordability today is much uh, better uh, and the in the last slide i'll also talk about web3 uh, what they are doing on the metaverse uh, and for me also it came as a shocker when i saw one of these companies saying that i am building a metaverse store for the rural uh, rural uh, part of india you know so they are targeting about um 50 million users in rural india on the metaverse uh, to me it looks far fetched but uh, you know i don't want to eat my words nothing is impossible in today's day and age uh, next slide please uh, 
um, the role of gamification. That's where we are, right? Okay. Now we spoke about all the problems of e-commerce. We spoke about what are the problems for sellers. We spoke about how the buyer has been spoiled over the years. And uh, we spoke about all of those aspects. So what can a seller really do in this context, right? I mean, if this is the ecosystem, then the seller has to say, uh, it's impossible to do business, right? Or you have to allow all the large, uh, you know, largely funded, you know, deep pocketed companies to take the market and then you just play a supporting role in the business. We believe that there is going to be democratization. We believe there is going to be fragmentation. And that is where we come in as, uh, you know, BitZap and uh, we bring in gamification into e-commerce. So I'll very quickly tell you what we do on the next slide, okay? So even before we talk about BitZap, let's look at the trends of the future of e-commerce according to me. Um, virtual and video first is going to be the decision-making process, right? Uh, earlier, we used to see uh, images or we used to read, uh, you know, specifications of a product and then we used to make a decision on whether to buy it or not. Um, we believe that's a trend that is dying. The trend that is really going to catch up is uh, virtual reality. So basically anything that can get me closest to touch, feel, smell and video at least, okay, is uh, going to be the trend going further. Um, turns goals into rewards, uh, basically converting uh, necessity into leisure. I'm going to club all of these points and just make a point over here at the end of it. So basically what we are talking about is that the future, okay, is all about giving the consumer a feel and reward at a time where, uh, you know, at, at his convenience. So examples over here are Zomato and Swiggy, okay. Now, what they have done is Zomato says, you are not interested in buying food right now, but you're free. Okay, so what you do is you play the Zomato Premier League. Okay, now what, what happens when you play the Zomato Premier League? You probably win a 50% discount on your next order. Now, what it means is that you were not waiting. As a seller, you're not waiting for the consumer to come and make a decision. Okay, you are proactively telling the consumer, come, I'll make it interesting for you and uh, giving him a reward for it, right? Swiggy does the same in a different way. Spin the wheel at the end of the order. Basically, uh, it's a cognitive hook, um, you know, and for basically increasing revenues. So in the future, we see that intrinsic motivation will lead to making choices rather than anything external, right? So uh, those, are the, those are the future of e-commerce, uh, you know, trends that we see. And uh, the most important thing that we are seeing emerging is the fact that a consumer is buying only when he feels good and he's feeling good at the time of game, you know, when there is a gamification involved, even if it is meaningless gamification rewards. When I say meaningless, what do I mean? There are, there are people playing games and they are winning badges. Those badges have no value. It's not that you can uh, convert that into any kind of currency or get a discount. There are gamification opportunities out there where a consumer is just being engaged, okay? And even that is giving the consumer a feel-good factor. And what has been noticed is brands that have adapted this have seen up to 50% increase in their top line, right? So gamification in the e-commerce industry, we believe is the way forward, right? So looking, looking at the next uh, slide, right? What have we done at BitZap? So I'll just wait for the slide to change and uh, so basically, BitZap is, you know, auction-led e-commerce. And this is available both in the B2C space as well as in the B2B space. So I will explain how it happens. In very short, we gamify e-commerce. What does that mean? That we put up products of great brands, brand new products. These are not used products. Okay? It's always brand new products are put up on not on an auction at 50% of its real value. I'll give you an example. Okay, we even auction two wheelers, brand new TVS bikes and Honda bikes. We also auction MacBook Airs, 
and we auction uh, one plus phones and you know so on and so forth absolutely new it could be delivered to your house or it could be picked up from a store near you it's one of the two uh, how long do these auctions last we've learned from ebay that it doesn't work if these auctions last too long so our auctions last anywhere between 3 to 5 minutes okay and what is it that the consumer gets he gets the thrill of feeling that okay i won in an auction ultimately all that he did was he was he was buying a product and he was getting a great deal but the thrill that i could win this product at 50 or 60 or 30% of its price is what drives okay uh, the the consumer to come back again and again okay now bizzat so far has worked with d2c brands and large brands uh, you know uh, as well as msmes so across the board we have been able to work with various brands um how it works sellers list their product with us we conduct those auctions the winner gets the product and for participating gets rewards okay apart from that he won the product at the best price ever in india he, there is no one else in the country who can give him that product at that price at which he won but more importantly what did the brand or the seller gain the brand and the seller gained awareness amongst hundreds of thousands of users okay he created an awareness he created an interest and in many cases created or generated leads for his himself at a product level so let's take for example a d2c brand which was not really well known let's take a cosmetic brand not if you've never heard of it but you came on bizzap and you saw that this product cost 5000 rupees is available you know on bizzap in an auction for 1000 rupees or auction starts at 1000 rupees auction ends at 2000 rupees all of a sudden the indian consumer who's always looking for deals is excited about it and starts to decide and you know starts reading about the product and decides whether he or she wants to participate in this auction or not and uh, the moment they decide to participate in an auction or not they have already become aware of this brand they have already become aware of this product if they participate in the auction we have the attention of that user for a full 3 to 5 minutes when they can't take their eyes off the screen because the auction is a very um uh, you know it's it's a very um uh, you know you the, the user has to be all the time you know actively involved with the auction he can't take his eyes off he can't take his brain into something else so we have his captive attention all the time and that is the time where bizzap helps the brand create awareness amongst these users right and whoever is interested we have trivia and we have other things whoever is interested we are able to generate leads for them then and there because there is an intent that is expressed by the uh, user right so that's how it works um, and most importantly what we have seen is like for example in a single auction we have seen participation of more than 3000 interested buyers where a brand had spent zero marketing money okay the brand had spent zero marketing money in a single auction for 3 minutes there were 3000 people in an auction and those 3000 people are potential buyers of that product and that brand we know that the brand gets that data okay and we could do this every day for that brand okay even if we did just one auction per day for that brand there is a possibility of generating 50000 to 100000 potential buyers for that brand right that is what uh, bizzap can do now when i said b2c and b2b i'm just going to quickly talk about that one thing b2c is where we have our own auctions that we conduct and brands can participate in it so which means they don't even have to have their own user base we will give them the user base that they can reach out to b2b is let's say for example there is a brand which is already selling offline or online they already have a large user base they want to you know re engage with their customers they want to give their customers a kind of engagement that they have never been able to give a kind of gamification of uh, you know their uh, selling their product to the consumer uh, and uh, bizzap empowers you know their back end for it 
so we are doing it with some very very large uh, brands are not allowed to use them but we are doing it with uh, some of the la- uh, some some of these uh, companies which are probably having a reach of about uh, 3.7 million households in india using the app at least six times every day okay it's i'm just giving you an example of a use case which came to us and said you know what i have 3.7 million households uh using my app five to six times a day but we are not able to make money out of it okay and uh, we are not able to see engagement beyond the basic reason why the app has been downloaded uh, we want to increase that engagement we want to create some excitement and we said okay we am we, we powered it it's going live we will know how it works in a, in, a, in a little bit of time we have similar use cases for shops in hyderabad shops in bangalore shops in bombay uh these are these are well known shops in the city okay uh, for example some a chain of shops that is selling electronic goods in uh, bangalore okay they have about 130 stores across karnataka about 60 stores in bangalore selling electronics they were not able to compete with selling online they had their own online uh, on shopify they had built their own online shop however they were not able to create the excitement so we said okay how can we create excitement we started running auctions for them and believe it or not they have run i think so so far about uh, 1000 plus auctions with us so what bitzap does is if you have a business and you want to create that buzz and excitement for your existing customers also we are able to do that right so that's what we do at bitzap moving ahead next uh, you know to the next slide um you know we've done this for D, like i've already spoken about it we've done this for d2c brands uh, um you know some of the some of the noteworthy points is that we don't charge them a listing fee or commission on sales uh we have a, a saas model for such uh, partners uh the best part is there is discovery without clutter basically when there is an auction the auction is purely for your brand and your product there is no clutter out there over there uh are according to our partners who have worked with us and clients who have worked with us our cac um and cost per lead is the lowest in the industry and they have come back to us time and again to work with us uh, so that's what we've been able to do for d2c brands so basically you know anybody who's looking at omni channel expansion bitzap is a great option we we are happy to uh, present it to anybody uh similar to bitzap now i i am not here to talk about bitzap i'm not here to sell bitzap okay but why i spoke about you know bitzap as an example is simply to tell you that you know the gamification aspect has created so much of interest in the market for various brands of various products right so we'll move to the next slide okay uh the same i've already spoken about it we have a b2b solution so i'm not going to talk about it again um, yeah so what are the new e-commerce trends apart from um, you know uh, gamification what we are seeing really is web3 the metaverse and beyond okay 3d graphics in the metaverse basically what we have seen is brands like nike coke gucci adidas and a lot more having invested millions of dollars in fact some of these brands have invested a hun- hundreds of millions of dollars to create properties on the metaverse uh, their belief is that the future is going to be very different um, so we all know what the metaverse does we all know what are the possibilities we have seen what uh, you know uh, nfts uh, you know uh, what kind of adaptation we saw what kind of drop we saw in the last a uh, few months so i'm not really going to focus on it too much because my personal belief is it's too early it's too very early to talk about the metaverse while i wanted to mention over here that there is a huge amount of interest amongst large brands uh to adapt and to be available on the metaverse for uh, you know for to, for their consumers to keep them engaged to keep them excited um i personally believe it's still too very early and the evolution where we will see smaller brands uh you know uh, being available on the metaverse and using the metaverse in one way or the other i think is a good 2 3 years away uh we will see what trends emerge we will see what kind of uh, data we are able to get out of uh, people who are already doing this so uh those are the new trends that we are seeing in the e-commerce industry 
these are our learnings okay uh, i'm repeating what i said at the beginning uh, that everybody who's in the e-commerce space has different learnings has different understanding by and large you know these are very common learnings uh, you know what what are other players doing to adapt uh, either gamification there are many ways to gamify e-commerce i only spoke about bitzap i only spoke about auctions there are so many more ways of adapting gamification within e-commerce right for example loyalty itself is a uh, you know huge uh, gamification system or you can gamify uh, your sales through you know um, uh, loyalty points and make it very very interesting that is one way to do it uh, there have been some very interesting uh, case studies in korea okay where offline online you know people have adapted some amazing uh, you know uh, gamification strategies and they're all available on youtube they're all available so i'm not going to bring some of that data and just put it up over here so there is a whole lot of things happening in the world of e-commerce the one thing I would like to end by saying is e-commerce is never going to be what it has been until now. The consumer is changing. Technology is changing. Demands are changing. Okay. And if you are selling, it doesn't matter if you are selling yourself or if you have clients who are selling, they need to adapt and they need to give the consumer what the consumer wants. Um, and gamification works it has worked in the past it will continue to work in the future right uh, so that is what i wanted to share um, uh, open to the floor sudhakar thank you so much uh, professor prasad thank you so much for the opportunity uh, over to you uh, thank you rajesh uh, that's been a wonderful interesting informative session on uh, the landscape of uh, gamification and what has been happening in india I think everything you have put together in one place uh, for the benefit of our participants and for all of us here to understand what are the emerging trends and uh, what are the things that we should be uh, we should be looking forward to. Though, though those things have been pretty clear in through your uh, slides and presentations that you have made. Uh, very very interesting uh, that uh, it is not just uh, about. Uh, the technology changes uh, which are moving from one paradigm to other from the current high speed internet to uh, say the augmented reality virtual reality metaverse age that we are transforming into are throwing a lot more options and uh, it's going to be more and more interesting as the investments are rising many brands are uh, believing strongly at this point in time as you rightly said they believe very very strongly that it is going to uh, create that kind of future. Uh, so uh, I, I was keenly following your slides and uh, it is very interesting uh, also because of the fact that uh, the landscape in India and how are the demands of the new consumer uh, are there. Uh, these are very interesting lessons uh, that uh, you have put out for the e-com players and also the technology players. Uh, that are. So understanding the customer has not only e-commerce, even in, in commerce in general, Understanding the customer has been uh, pretty interesting, the changing profile and the changing demands. Uh, I think everywhere, not just in one world or the other, everywhere I think the, the customer is changing fast and the demands are pretty unmatchable kind of demands sometimes. You, know? you are kept on your tenterhooks and this is a challenge to all the sellers. Uh, uh, or whatever be the mode of uh, selling that we may adopt to. So it's pretty interesting. I don't want to put together and I'm sure everyone liked it. So what we'll do now is uh, without much ado, we will get into the Q&A session. Uh, the Q&A session will have about a couple of clusters of questions. These questions are collected from various participants at the time of registration and, and it has been landscaped into a particular sequence uh, to ask the question. So the first cluster will be taken up by Professor Prasad. I'll request him to start the first cluster and we'll use the next 30 minutes to uh, completely focus on this Q and A, and we'll open the window for some of those uh, um, uh, some of those participants who would like to ask you the questions. That we'll do in the second cluster when I come back. Uh, Professor Prasad, first cluster. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Indeed, an extremely interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, 
brings together some of the major developments which are taking place, which have impact not only in e-commerce, but across the board. Um, I think the, the, the problems and challenges and the new kind of consumer behavior, the, I mean, I, it looks like the entropy of the consumer is increasing, you know, uh, there's a certain kind of restlessness which is seen in the consumer. And then you're trying to find out a solution by which you can capture right on that restlessness on that entropy and then encash it into a revenue uh, sale kind of a thing. I think that is uh, useful across the board. I mean, it is useful even in education because people you know, have a thousand and one things and they're not able to focus. They are immersed in all that. Now, how do you pull them from there and get them to, to learn something? I think even there it is quite applicable. So there is a kind of a framework there which seems to be extremely interesting. Uh, to begin with, uh, I'll come to the first question. It's a bit more about yourself. I think across all this experience, what are the key things and competencies that you gained in order to be able to implement something like this? Well, uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, the one thing, you know, uh, <laughs> is that change is the only thing that is constant, right? So from a from from various learnings, um, you know, various experiences, starting from what um, my, the time I spent at Just Dial, and uh, after Just Dial, what we did at Dunzo, um, or uh, uh, or for that matter, uh, you know, in the gaming industry, the one key learning is that if you do not adapt on a daily basis, and if you are not willing to change your approach to your consumer on a daily basis, okay, then you are going to be uh, in deep trouble. Uh, it doesn't work in today's day and age. That was one, one key learning. The other key learning is that you need to disrupt yourself. If you're not disrupting yourself, then you're open to disruption. Somebody else is going to disrupt you. Okay, that was the second key learning. And then, uh, you know, we've had some good experiences by, uh, you know, of, wherever we kept disrupting ourselves and we kept, I'll give you an example, Professor Prasad. So when we launched BitZap, right, we had a, we had a, you know, very highly gamified approach. For example, if you're, if a, if a participant, participant in the auction had a better quality of phone, let's say he had a gaming phone, his chances of winning the auction were much higher because it was time bound to, to a millisecond. Okay. And very quickly we learned that out of every 100 auctions, there were two or three guys who were winning 1995 auctions and the rest of them were getting very disappointed. So we had to completely change the whole mechanism of auctions and come back in a manner where nobody had an unfair advantage, right? And what we realized is because we did that, we were able to retain and grow our consumer base, uh, you know, to a million consumers already. And while we were uh, while we were at the with the old mechanism, trust me, we were not able to go from a hundred thousand users to hundred and fifty thousand users because new users would come in, understand that they have no chance of winning, and they would go away. So we had to disrupt ourselves, and that has been something, uh, Professor Prasad, that has been my learning in life across businesses. That no matter who you are, no matter how big you are, no matter how new you are. Okay, you have to keep disrupting yourself. That is the key learning that I have. Excellent. I think two key points. First is about the mindset, which always needs to be open, curious about what's happening, being able to have on your radar things which are changing, being able to notice it. And second, if there's nothing happening there, still you need to disrupt yourself because something may be happening there and you may not actually be noticing. Thank you. I think uh, the next uh, question is is about, you know, uh, at this stage, if you look at uh, the e-commerce industry, yes, you have uh, listed out some of the pain points, but if you have to take the biggest challenge which is facing the industry, what would you say it is? The biggest challenge the e-commerce industry is facing right now, apart from the regulation, is uh, that they are unable to, um, the whole industry is unable to keep the balance of real trade. According to me, okay, uh, business is basically when you buy a product at X and you have a profit and you add all your costs to that, okay? And then you mock up and you sell, right? Now, in the e-commerce industry, the biggest challenge is that everybody is trying to win a consumer event today. 
and in the bargain okay they are taking losses on logistics they are taking losses on returns um and uh, um the consumer is being uh, mollycoddled to an extent that businesses are burning money in the hope that the lifetime value of the customer eventually will make sense to us uh but that's not going to happen in my opinion okay uh, even today i'm using these names professor uh, uh, prasad for example i know i trust amazon the most right personally if, if i have to buy something i will buy on amazon today but i will still look for the best price in the market and trust me in the my personal experience of buying a few home decor products which were available on amazon i actually went and bought from the seller's personal platform on shopify which he's built because i was able to get a better price so um and uh, to the extent that i had no cash on delivery and these are i'm citing examples i had no cash on delivery on the seller's uh, you know platform i didn't care i today as a consumer i trust i am ready to pay that money up front because i trust that the product will come to me right so even though amazon has spent probably millions of dollars in gaining my trust at the time of making that decision i am ready to go so i am probably uh, you know one consumer but i know a lot of people who are doing that so the biggest problem e-commerce industries are i mean in e-commerce companies are facing is that they are not able to uh, bring that balance of making money and keeping the consumer happy because they are not keeping uh, my opinion is that you know the expectations they are setting is not realistic i think you're also adding on to this point that uh, consumers are becoming more aware they know of the other possibilities other new platforms are coming in and uh, finally there is fragmentation is going to happen and you're going to get better deals elsewhere and i think all this is happening together it fits in with your point about what you think about the future of uh, e-commerce but fragmentation is going to be there thank you i now move on to the third question this is Uh, how effective is gamification in enhancing uh, customer loyalty uh, can you share some examples oh yeah uh, i i'll i'll go back to the uh, zomato premier league and i'll go back to the spin the wheel on swiggy right um, so every time i order on swiggy now i'll tell you some uh, again personal examples uh, swiggy promises you at the time of taking the order let's say 35 minutes the food will reach you but Uh, more often than not because of uh, rain or because of whatever reason sometimes it takes 50 minutes or 55 minutes and the food is not come in uh, you are very pissed off for those 15 20 minutes because you they set an expectation of 35 minutes and they didn't deliver in 35 minutes right however at the end of the order there is spin the wheel and uh, you you probably won uh, 20% discount on your next order now i have realized that i might have been pissed yesterday but today while ordering i'll go back to swiggy because i have that 20% off on that uh next order and that 20% off is valid maybe for 3 days only right i will still go back to it so that is gamification and that is keeping me hooked on to that particular platform to order food again and again okay uh that is one example gamification does uh, if it is linked with reward or not linked with reward now i'll talk about examples of what is not linked with reward right now uh, like i was talking about those badges that you pick there are many uh, i don't want to name certain uh, platforms but there are many platforms which just make you play uh, a game okay which is probably a 30 second game and if you win you get a badge and you go on collecting a badge right and there is absolutely no reward there is no conversion into any kind of a currency or you can't encash it or uh, you know uh, use it for any benefit it's just the fact that it's a feel good factor you're getting i have collected so many badges now that is engagement the more you are engaged on a particular platform at the time of spending money it's a very high probability that you will still go back and spend money on that platform now without gamification the challenge for such such platforms is that uh the consumer would have come to you only if you were top of the mind recall when he was planning to buy so what you are ensuring with gamification is that you are top of the mind recall okay you are keeping him engaged you are keeping him entertained okay so that works as well so yes gamification helps in you know uh, keeping a consumer hooked to you 
So top of the mind uh, recall is one connect which we have for those who only engage and don't give any uh, economic rewards to the engagement. And the other thing I think that we, uh, we mentioned is that uh, there's a service deliverable which did not take place and gamification put a substitute to it and uh, you know, got them back to as a customer. Absolutely, absolutely. Just like to add one single point to it. Now there are new trends in uh, you know fin in the fintech industry, which is gamifying e-commerce as well in a in a small way, in a different way. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, like I spoke about uh, collecting money in installments. Uh, you know, with a mandate on UPI, right? Now that itself can be gamified so beautifully. Uh, there are many uh, companies like say, for example, there's a company in Bangalore called Decentro. It's a Y Combinator company. They are empowering, uh, you know, startups to get um, APIs to be able to integrate buy now, pay later on UPI. And uh, uh, what that does is for a consumer who is salaried, let's say, for example, somebody who's earning 50,000 rupees a month, 60,000 rupees a month, it makes a huge amount of difference. Until now, and this is why I wanted to mention this point, until now, the entire underwriting of that loan was coming from an NBFC or coming from a, a fintech partner who was taking the risk. There were partners who were taking part risk with FLDG and so on and so forth. However, now going further, Okay, I personally believe that a lot of small online sellers, even sellers without GST, will be able to underwrite this on their own. I'll give you a very simple example, uh, Professor Prasad. Now, let's say, for example, somebody is, uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, you know, these kind of phone covers, right? Uh, and the cost of this phone cover may be 100 rupees to him, but he's selling it at 900 rupees. Okay, that's the kind of margin. Uh, phone is just one example, the phone cover, there could be any product. Now, when the margin is so huge, he doesn't need an NBFC to, you know, underwrite that risk. What these guys, what these sellers are going to do going further is they are going to come and tell online platforms that, you know, you collect the money in three installments, zero uh, interest. It's okay if the customer doesn't pay after the first installment. Because within the first installment, he has recovered 3x of his cost. Okay. Now, that is the extreme case where there is an 800% margin. But there are even more, uh, you know, realistic cases where there is 100% margin also. Right. A 100 rupee product being sold at 200 rupees is still great for a seller. Because if he gives you three installments, he's already recovered 66%, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 33% of the cost in the uh, first installment. Right. Um, so one of this, all of this is going to get gamified where small sellers will no longer depend on NBFCs to give you that underwriting capability. They will start underwriting it and, uh, SAS players will start giving these small players ability to have algorithms to underwrite that risk or not to underwrite that risk. So this is the new, emer this is a new emerging trend that is coming very, very encouraging for the 50 million small MSMEs because they will be able to get a lot of new customers simply because of this, uh, you know, new trend. Excellent. I think you've responded to another question, which is uh, very spot on on that. What are the opportunities for a small manufacturer to get into e-commerce with the low cost of operation and high margin? And I think you, this uh, example has fitted in very well into that. Would you like to add something to that? Yeah, the only thing I would like to add is that I would love to speak to this gentleman. I have some <laughs> synergy that we could do business with. <laughs> no, uh, uh, you know, for manufacturers, especially, I think uh, the a time to come, uh, you know, is very, very encouraging because uh, if they can eliminate all, uh, you know, in the, in the supply chain, if they can eliminate everyone else, there are two pieces which are, uh, one is the fintech piece, which is very easily available today. The other is the logistics piece, which is very easily available today with companies like Shiprocket and Picker and, uh, you know, Delivery and everyone else uh, doing a beautiful job. Actually, manufacturers, in my opinion, uh, with high margins should eliminate uh, people in the supply chain, supply directly, get online. There are enough uh, 
there are enough, uh, you know, Shopify is just one example. Shopify, in my, my opinion, is expensive um, to, you know, run a store, but they're good. Uh, there are other players out there in the market. I run another company which has uh, called, which is called Zuzul Shop. Uh, we enable uh, you know manufacturers to set up their own online stores, including payment and logistic support, for as low as five hundred rupees a fixed fee, fixed fee of as low as five hundred rupees a month, right? Um, so, for manufacturers, I think the time to come is very encouraging. The word of caution is. Uh, Quality has to be, you know, extremely, uh, you have to be very quality conscious as a manufacturer. You have to cater to a market uh, which is going to compare you with the best in the world. So in your, in your eagerness to keep the price low, um, you know, do not compromise on quality is the only other aspect that I would like to mention over here. Thank you. I think the power is off here. So sorry for the disturbance. I think you also responded to another question which came in uh, about, you know, and the concern there was is gamification in e-commerce assigned to attract, acquire customers, but throwing the wind as far as the service deliverable speech. I think you responded to that in your earlier response, but would you like to add to that again? I, I didn't understand the question. If you don't mind, could you just elaborate for me? Yeah. Uh, uh, this was a concern. I mean, uh, okay. by one of the uh, those who are attending is gamification in e-commerce assigned to attract, acquire customers, but throwing into the wind, the service deliverable switch. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, a very valid question. Uh, the answer is really no. Uh, see, if you want to remain in business in the long term, there are few uh, basic, you know, basics of business that cannot be compromised. One is the quality of your product, the quality of your service. There is, response to your consumers, uh, you know, requirements. Those are all a given. Uh, you know, when we say gamification in e-commerce, assuming that all of that is in place, that's the basic foundation of your business. Gamification in e-commerce is basically, a, 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 you know, a tool to uh, probably get a consumer or attract, uh, you know, engage a consumer and make it interesting because, you know, you want to give the pe person a feeling that, you know, he won something or you want him to, you know, have fun while shopping. Okay. That's all. But if, if your basics are not in place, you're not going to last in business. So don't even, I mean, it's no, it's not a substitute for anything else. Absolutely. I think the basic economic value needs to be in place and uh, the other things add on and build around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've been engaged with a lot of startups. You're a serial entrepreneur. So, uh, how do you get a feel whether a startup will be successful or not? What do you look for? I have spoken about it in several public forums. I am a person who goes by my gut. Uh, many years ago, I met a gentleman called Julian uh, Robertson. Uh, I learned whatever I learned about uh, startup investments from him. Uh, he was the original founder of the Tiger Fund. Uh, and uh, my three questions to him were very similar to, you know, how do I make a investment? Should I, how can I decide whether it's worth it or not? Uh, he had given me some insights. I'm sharing that with you, right? Uh, he said that he never invests in a business idea. He always invests in the founder. He said, it's the team that makes the business work. It's not the idea that makes the business work. That was number one. Number two, he said that, you know, creating a new habit is very difficult and it's a very time consuming process. So if possible, invest in a business where the market is already existing and you're trying to get a piece of that market in a more innovative manner, or you're trying to bring in some value into that business. So that was the other um, uh, learning. And the third is obviously uh, what I have followed all my life is my gut. Sometimes you have a gut and uh, you just follow your gut, um, you know, that's about it. I mean, sometimes data can't uh, always work. You know, when I made an investment in Dunzo, there was absolutely no chance that there was any data uh, which could prove that Dunzo will succeed. Or for that matter, last uh, a few months ago, I made an investment in a startup uh, which is fragmenting real estate to a token level. So I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, what this startup does and then you'll, you'll you know, uh, until now, there are fragmented real estate opportunities where you can invest 10 lakhs uh, a piece or 25 lakhs a piece and own a small piece of the real estate. But 
like an SIP, where can you invest 500 rupees a month and own up, you know, one square feet of or or a part of a square feet of a Marriott hotel, or a trade tower, world trade tower, you know. Uh, so this startup is doing something like that. It's called Alt A L T Alt D R X. That's the Alt Digital Real Exchange, uh, Digital Real Estate Exchange. Alt D R X dot com. Uh, the the team is wonderful. Okay, idea is amazing because at the end of the day, the underlying asset for an investor is uh, basically uh, real estate. Nothing can go wrong with it. I mean, you know, and you have a monthly yield. Right. So while the business model, you know, that is uh, very, very solid, the gut was that this team will be able to pull it off. Okay. And uh, uh, it's worked. It's worked for us. When I invested in the month of April uh, at an X value, they have now raised their next round at 7X of that value. So uh, April till now, it's about on paper valuation is about seven X. Uh, you follow your gut, you believe some sometimes and you just make those investments. It works. Uh, you know, while, while all of us speak about all our success stories, uh, for every one success story, there are at least three or four failures. Okay, and don't get enamored. I mean, if you're planning to invest in startups, follow your own path. There is no formula that can teach you that this will succeed or not. That's my gut. Absolutely. I think what you mentioned is more fundamental than technical uh, about how the team is, uh, what your gut feel is and uh, about riding uh, a current wave and then adding value to it rather than trying to change the world. Uh, there are a couple of more questions, but uh, I'll stop here and hand it back to Professor Rao. Thank you very much. You should have actually continued. It is very, very interesting in terms of uh, uh, Rajesh's responses to some of the uh, very interesting uh, um, <clears throat> questions on startups and uh, how small businesses with uh, high margins can do. I think that's a fantastic response we have heard from uh, Rajesh on that. And I'm sure it is going to come back again in some form or the other. So ladies and gentlemen, what I suggest uh, to some of the enthusiastic participants is if you have questions to directly ask Mr. Rajesh, you can raise your hand and I will uh, make sure that uh, you're brought on uh, along with uh, audio being opened for you to ask the question directly. In the meantime, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll raise a couple of questions and then see uh, what we can do out there. It's, it's already five o'clock, uh, five, six. Maybe uh, we will take a few questions here and also direct questions from the audience now. Uh, Rajesh, with your permission, uh, the second cluster has questions on application. I'll try to make it very short. Uh, but let's see, uh, but these are curious questions in terms of how gamification is being applied in variety of sectors and variety of businesses uh, that some of the participants think can be looked at and some ideas they would like to seek from you as well. How can gaming trigger, I mean, this is a, this is a loaded question. How can gaming trigger a consumer while purchasing a hygiene product? With a with lot of doubt, this question has been raised. For example, someone is purchasing a hygiene product. How can gaming help trigger uh, curiosity and interest in the consumer? I really don't have a uh, you know very specific answer to that, Sudhakar. I it'll have to be thought through. Yes. Um, you know. Uh, however, uh, you know the answers go back to what I've already spoken. See, gaming gamification of uh, you know any business. Uh, basically, what it does is it creates uh, engagement. It creates awareness. And it creates a certain amount of affinity with the brand. Now, whether it's a hygiene product or whether it is anything else, the consumer at the end of the day feels connected to the brand. Right? Now, if you're trying to drive information, okay, saying that this particular hygiene product is better than some other hygiene product. If the intent is to uh, educate the customer about the benefits that your hygiene product is able to provide. Okay, that can be gamified very well, right? So the, the question itself is not fully clear to me. So if the if I understand what is the objective, that that can be answered better. But I think this is what the uh, person is asking. Uh, so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, gamification can be used for educating your consumer very, very well. So the games have to be designed. Okay, the engagement has to be designed. 
there are enough players out there in the market who can create these uh, you know uh, products uh, if it is online even if it is off offline it can be created i think that's my answer for that fantastic uh, we have one hand raised that we'll come to little later uh, probably uh, some explanation will be there uh, second question that we have is uh, second question that we have is uh, is there any dedicated organization in india to regulate and certify online gamification uh, does it does it uh, fall under or do we have any organization for regulation so i'll explain uh, this is a very good question a very very valid question right so people often confuse gamification to gaming both are very different okay um online gaming okay also has multiple parts to it there is real money gaming and then there is hyper local gaming uh, so let's first differentiate between gamification and gaming right gamification is basically when you are adapting any kind of a gamification strategy to engage with a consumer where the consumer has you know you might be able to give him loyalty points so you may be able to give him discount so you may be able to give him some reward for participating now in such a case the consumer is not paying any money up front to participate in the game okay that's gamification so those are strategies again they are used for multiple reasons sometimes it's used for cons uh, acquiring consumers sometimes for retention of consumers and sometimes for education of consumers that's gamification gaming by itself is a completely different uh, you know business now in india there are games like poker and rummy which fall under real money gaming there are certain states which allow it there are certain states which do not allow it it's a state subject okay now um, they they require to go under the uh, you know and find out if there if there are regulations and they need to get their licenses and stuff like that however even there there is no licensing authority to the best of my knowledge okay pure gamification for your business nothing to worry there is nothing that is required even for hyper local game hyper hyper casual gaming where there is no money in money out there is nothing that is required it is basically for entertainment fantastic it's very clear now the difference between gamification and gaming and within gaming the serious gaming like real money gaming has to be regulated and it's a state subject depending on the state's policies i think one will have to take the approval with the from the state government whereas the casual gaming probably doesn't uh, at all come under the uh, ambit of regulation so that's pretty clear and uh, this confusion is there among many people actually even i used to get confused earlier about this thing and read one for the other and uh, and and subsequently uh, clarify so this is a very genuine question among uh, most of the uh, participants probably okay that's clarified now thank you very much uh, <clears throat> there's another interesting question again uh, it calls for application how can gamification be used for nudging consumers towards responsible consumption it falls under education so you use it, it you know you can use gamification within your uh, you know platform uh, to make the consumer aware so basically educate him on how to use when to use when not to use what not to do through a game okay now for different products different uh, you know industries these games can be created you know um, again uh, there are several players out there in the market we don't we don't do it but there are several players out there in the market who will be more than helpful in understanding what needs what is the message that needs to go across and then they'll create games which will be very exciting engaging at the same time it will do the job of communicating what they are trying to communicate Uh, but can you force anybody uh, to behave responsibly uh, you know it's not possible you know at the end of the day to the you know you can tell a consumer what is good for him or what is not good for him or what is allowed or what is not allowed the consumer will still do what he wants to do absolutely we can't force anyone but but the question asked was can we probably orient or nudge a little bit towards responsible of course, of uh, course. The answer is yes yes answer is yes yeah okay. great uh what i will do now is i will take that question uh, from uh, uh, ms lavanya uh, uh, good evening sir Hi. am i audible sir yes yes uh, sir uh, how can the games help in uh, 
uh, resolving prisoners dilemma and game theory sir i'm sorry i couldn't hear you how can you had spoken about gamification so how can your games help in resolving prisoners dilemma and game theory sir uh there is dilemma in game theory in strategic management and in economics there is game theory and prisoners dilemma ha 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 and nobel prize was given for and, game theory so let's just add add to add to that point right i think again this is something similar to the earlier question that you took there is gamification yeah. and there is game theory game theory which is part taught as part of management how to optimize decisions how to get to that depending on how people play and the prisoners dilemma is one of those theories in that in game theory correct yeah i i agree with you professor prasad so basically the difference between gaming and gamification needs to be uh, brought out here lavanya so we are not talking about creating games we are talking about gamifying the whole experience of uh, e commerce people to buy which is uh, uh, which is not which is not gaming that's all uh, uh wa uh, thank you lavanya ji for uh, raising that question but there's a difference between gamification and gaming as we have been uh, trying to understand from mr rajesh uh, sir there is one more question in the same uh, thing but it is uh, a little better that is why gaming is still considered negatively by people and how does the awareness and opportunities be created in gaming i mean the, it is clear it is not gamification one is talking about it is gaming the negative perceptions that are prevailing right 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 it's in uh, again this is my view sudhakar it's very yeah. important to first you know trying to uh, advocate it's my personal or negative i lost network in between yeah yeah right so the whole negativity around gaming sudhakar is all about the real money gaming you know gambling uh, some people have a view that it shouldn't be allowed uh, that's what i said earlier that you know there are certain it's a state subject uh, there are uh, certain uh, state government Uh, state governments like west bengal and sikkim and stuff i'm not able to hear what mr rajesh was mentioning is that it is already allowed in certain states uh, like for example sikkim uh, it's been openly permitted in certain other states uh, probably in goa it is permitted but uh, but in states like telangana and uh, probably andhra pradesh it is not uh, permitted so it's yeah. a state subject uh, yes rajesh yeah sorry so yeah as i was saying that you know it's a very uh, personal view uh, you know i don't have a very negative view about it i believe that every human being should have a choice to do what he or she wants to do um you know the 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 government in india allows uh, alcohol to be sold uh, there are uh, race tracks in the country where there is horse racing and tax is being collected uh so i believe that we are in 2022 now and we don't need to be governed governed for everything people should be allowed to make their choices and uh, businesses should be allowed to run that's my personal view um you know and as a as a as a country you know if you look at uh, the diwali every household there are uh, card games and gambling within families that happen uh that is something that i don't understand but if somebody has a negative view about the whole gaming industry uh you know especially real money gaming that's perfectly all right it's nice to have a view and then uh, such people should stay away from such gaming companies great uh, that that's pretty clear if there are any other questions say please raise your hand meanwhile i'll try and understand something from mr rajesh uh, this is about uh, one uh, question which is asking can gamification be simplified uh, the question looks like uh, too simplistic but probably the participant is trying to understand that gamification process itself has been uh, uh, complex or difficult for some of the part of uh, some of the players or audience to participate so how can gamification be simplified probably that is a real question actually uh, it's a very pertinent question gamification needs to be simplified i completely agree with it but not to the consumer i think to the consumer it is pretty simple because most companies and most products that have most brands that have used gamification have used very simple gamification it is actually complex for a seller or a brand to build such uh, you know products or to build such uh, uh, you know games uh, to uh, engage with their consumers and uh, there are quite a few there are quite a few companies example is zynga 
you know, Zynga has built several games uh, which multi-billion dollar brands have used to engage with their consumers and have done a, a, a you know, wonderful job. But everybody cannot afford Zynga today. Right? A small seller in India should have access to companies that are able to give him uh, ready-made games to engage with his, con with his consumers. Uh, what I will do, Sudhakar, is if I can find a list of such uh, providers in, in India, I will share it with you and you can share it with the participants. Uh, I think, in my opinion, it should be simplified for sellers and for online platforms more than the consumer. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question that I have uh, is, uh, what are the leadership challenges faced in such organizations? Probably the participant is trying to understand uh, what are the enablers that the leader should work on or what are the things that the leaders should deal with in making the success out of these organizations when you are using gamification as a process? I think, I think a good leadership team will always uh, treat gamification as a separate uh, department by itself, right? You should have a dedicated resource who is understanding your consumer, who is understanding your, uh, you know, objective of gamifying anything within your business. If you are able to, uh, you know, have a dedicated resource looking at it, uh, most often leaders make a mistake of thinking, okay, it's just gamification, it's not my core business. And therefore, somebody within the organization is going to, you know, manage it for me. I don't need to dedicate anyone else for it. I think that's a mistake, right? If you are serious about engaging with your consumers, if you're serious about giving your consumers that amazing, uh, you know, experience, then you need a dedicated resource, just like how you have a customer support department or you have a HR department. I think you should have a dedicated resource handling gamification within your organization. That's part one. The other thing that a leadership team needs to look at is sometimes, you know, when it comes to um, uh, managing profitability, the first thing you start cutting out is what you think is not necessary, right? Uh, a good leadership team will always invest in the future, not just in the present. So, a you know, a good strategy would be to have budgets, uh, you know, at least for 12 to 24 months. Uh, you know, for gamification and to have realistic expectations in terms of ROI. Uh, you know, not treat not treat gamification as an expense or don't look at instant rewards. Uh, you'll have to be patient. So the leadership team needs to have, uh, you know, awareness of such things. Very, very uh, clear uh, implications for the leaders or the leadership team mm -hmm. with respect to gamification in their organization. Treat it as a core function and also yeah treat it as an investment uh, for future with respect to, uh, to with respect to rationalizing one's own expectations on this thing and be patient about the results. So that's uh, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Rajesh. Uh, 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 Professor Prasad, would you have any question uh, before that, uh, after, after which I'll come back and wrap it up. Uh, if you have anyone, please take it. Yes, there is uh, one question uh, which is pertains to education. Um, Part of what you do in gamification is basically get, get people interested, engaged with respect to a particular product. Look, in your imagination or in your experience, uh, is it possible to do so in education, not at the point of sale, but to get people to get educated more once they enter a program? Because at a given point in time, a person has a certain intent. So can I increase that intent through gamification? If so, do existing things that you work on at your organization apply or it's a completely different ballgame? Oh, uh, very nice question, uh, Professor Prasad. So if I've understood it right, I'll answer it. Um, I think education overall needs to be gamified. Forget about the intent or forget about the point of closure for, uh, you know, application. Uh, gamification at that stage is extremely crucial. No doubt about it. Uh, however, I also personally believe the way in, uh, uh, not just in India and in most parts of the world, and more so in India, the way students are taught, right, um, can be gamified. It should be gamified. Make it more interesting. Make it more, uh, you know, uh, future ready. Uh, I think education requires an overall, overhaul, overall, you know. 
I, I, I personally believe in it. To answer the second part of your question, do I do anything about it in our uh, within within Bitzap or within Zuzul or within any of? Um, yes, we do. Uh, um, you know, especially with lead generation and intent to close, we have uh, an audience which is in the age group of 18 to 33. We have over a million such users. Uh, our current engagement is roughly about 200,000 monthly active users, and with these 200 monthly active, 200,000. Monthly active users, we have uh, uh, their captive time of more than 20, 25 minutes in a month, right? And that is a, a hell of a lot of time where uh, they're completely captive. They're not doing anything else. They're not even reading WhatsApp messages because they're on the screen and participating in auctions, right? So we have capability to do a lot uh, over there in terms of awareness and then creating intent to move forward. That is something we can do. For education, my belief is yes, it should be gamified, but we don't have, uh, a, you know, anything that we have built for that right now. I think there was a supplementary while the response was been given by one of the participation participants. Right. I right. think the question there was uh, people may tend to remember the game but not the concept. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, I mean, if the concept or the main product that you are selling is not good enough, then that can happen. Like I said, the answer is uh, exactly what we said earlier. You know, your basics of business cannot be compromised and, you know, you cannot depend on the game being everything else or the gamification being everything else over there. The idea uh, for any business leader should be that gamification is a support system and not the core business. So please focus on core business, ensure your quality and service and everything else is, uh, you know, world class. And then use gamification to enhance and uh, amplify, you know, not to uh, depend on gamification for survival, that, that suicide. I think uh, we get back to the same point. Don't forget your fundamentals. <laughs> and Absolutely. I think the, the main player needs to remember that. Absolutely. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Back to Professor Rao. Thank you very much. It is so interesting that in one of the previous sessions, uh, we have had this uh, exact point coming up. Uh, uh, when we when we try to uh, create uh, uh, activities which are uh, uh, which are not normal and which dramatize engagement and involvement of these people by way of uh, your uh, cognitive branding, for example, when you do that, uh, the the people remember some of the elements in the advertisement uh, because of the cognitive element uh, cognitive branding techniques but they forget the brand itself or the product itself. So if you don't successfully weave the product or the brand into the game or into the gamification process, probably we again forget there. So as Professor Prasad said, the essence of the brand or, or, or the product has to be kept intact. And this is just an add-on, as Mr. Rajesh mentioned, it's an add-on, add value to what, what already is the core. So thank you very much on that. This uh, brings us, uh, uh, Rajesh, uh, to a fantastic uh, 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 masterclass on gamification. Uh, this is a fantastic session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this. And I would like to, uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, the participants, very quickly summarize some of the important takeaways. There are a huge number of takeaways, but I'll focus on uh, uh, very few, and then we'll take it forward uh, from there uh, with your permission. Uh, <clears throat> I think the session has been uh, uh, very informative. Uh, it has uh, uh, reaffirmed some of our learnings uh, on the emerging trends in e-commerce and how the landscape of e-commerce itself is getting ready to uh, benefited by gamification process and gamification is using some of the game strategies to uh, pick customer interest, whether it is online or offline. A variety of uh, uh, things can be done. It is based on generally using rewards and achievements to induce the customer to take the desired actions. Uh, in other words, gamification is about engaging customers in the brand and its products by offering a gamified experience. And the goal of a gamified marketing design is to entertain, educate, and engage. Gamification can be a useful tool in smoothing out uh, the journey of the buyer uh, while keeping them totally happy and engaged uh, with us, with the, with, the, with the brand. 
Sometimes it could be offering uh, the consumers uh, personalized product recommendations based on their answers to some simple questions or using wheels of fortune to give away discounts or other types of rewards or deals or offering customer loyalty programs where customers use loyalty points as milestones to achieve through certain actions and events such as placing an order, leaving a review, sending out the referral link to their friends on birthdays, so on and so forth. There are many e-com players, big and small. There are enough uh, strategies to be built in terms of differentiating oneself uh, on your e-commerce store, your brand, your products and services. Uh, we will, one will have to be very creative enough and there are resources available. There are special uh, domain specific uh, gaming companies and gamification uh, campaign makers are available who can uh, help us bring in the differentiation. Uh, we have also looked at uh, how auction-led e-commerce uh, reduces uh, the cost of acquisition and makes the, uh, the shopping exercise a fun exercise. We've also looked at uh, the applications from Web 3.0 uh, shaping the future of gamification, uh, not just in India, but around the world. Uh, these are some of the big points uh, that uh, we looked at. And the other things that we have learned uh, essentially uh, from the whole conversation, both in terms of the opening remarks as well as the Q&A from Mr. Rajesh is uh, your ability to adapt yourself, your business on a daily basis and also disrupt yourself. If you don't disrupt yourself, I think others will disrupt you. And that's a very, very interesting point that stays with us. And uh, it is applicable to individuals as well as organizations. So that's a big, big uh, nice response on that. Traditionally, uh, the biggest challenge uh, that we are seeing uh, in uh, the entire uh, process, according to Mr. Rajesh, is that they are uh, not able to keep the balance of the real trade. That is, uh, one is to spend a lot of money in acquiring the customer in the hope that the lifetime value of that customer on this brand or on their platform will be much bigger. But which is not turning out to be true and bigger players, bigger platforms are also losing money. And therefore, uh, therefore uh, that, that, is, that is a big, big challenge uh, for everyone. And uh, the hope, once, once that is a challenge, the hope uh, that uh, Mr. Rajesh has uh, given us is that smaller players can very well underwrite uh, themselves because, uh, because of the high margins that they operate in, they can eliminate the middlemen they don't, they don't have to depend on the NBFCs. Uh, some of the fintechs are able to do already. Some of the logistics companies are able to do. Even manufacturers uh, can, do, can do. And one of the companies uh, um, uh, supported by uh, Mr. Rajesh is trying to build online stores at a very, very low uh, fixed cost per month. Uh, so that is, that is something that uh, one uh, looks for. That's a very, very positive uh, startup. Uh, some of the lessons for the startups and some of the participants are uh, startups and they have uh, uh, to take home this important thing and also the investors in the startups. That is, we don't go by the idea itself all along in evaluating a startup. It is the team that one bets on. And beyond data, the second point is beyond data, we need to bet on one's own gut. There are no fixed formulae to evaluating what is going to succeed or what is not going to succeed. If we are at the right time riding the wave uh, and one can make uh, that assessment based on one's gut feeling, I think that one should go by. Uh, data will not give the entire picture uh, most of the times. I think that that's a uh, pretty, uh, pretty good suggestion for those uh, involved in this. The other important point uh, that uh, Mr. Rajesh has mentioned, and it is to my liking, is that uh, education needs a complete overall and uh, gamification has to come big way in the way we actually educate. So education as a, as, a, as, a, as a segment, as a sector, will have to take this. And this is very useful for us as well. And uh, we can partner uh, with uh, some of the people, including uh, BitZap, uh, to, to look at what kind of synergies we have and how we can work together, both in terms of uh, uh, closures as well as uh, generating leads uh, there. I think that, that one can uh, look for. The other thing is uh, the lessons for the leaders uh, in these organizations is to treat uh, leadership, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, gamification as a process, as a core function. Therefore, dedicate resources for them and don't treat it as uh, something not core. So that is going to be very 
important to expect results from them, uh, treat it as a core function like any other function. And also be patient and have realistic expectations on the ROIs from the gamification. And there should be budgets that are ranging from 12 months to 24 months. And uh, more importantly, realistic expectations from those uh, budgets. I think uh, 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 several uh, uh, several takeaways beyond what I mentioned also have been there part of this uh, interesting session. Uh, Rajesh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. You were disturbed a little bit by the by the internet at your end, which was not in your control, but they're absolutely fine. Uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, given the benefit of listening to you in terms of uh, your views and perceptions, as well as some of the initiatives that you have taken through your group organizations. Uh, all along, it's been fantastic uh, listening to you. Thank you very much uh, for this session uh, once again. Uh, thank you, Sudhakar. Um, always a pleasure talking to you. Look forward to more interactions with you and Professor Prasad. And thank you to everyone for your time. Uh, I'm very honored to be able to share my thoughts with you guys. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, on this note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, while we thank uh, Mr. Rajesh uh, for his time and expertise uh, to spend with us, I will send some of the other questions uh, that remain unanswered or we are not able to raise so that he will come back. And, and I'll also share a summary with you, Rajesh, uh, so that you can go over that and see if all the points have been covered. And then probably we can share those uh, bullet points with our audience as well in public. Uh, in, in, on our archives, we can put the same uh, summary. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your participation. And this subject has been a very interesting subject. And, and also at the same time, it is a niche subject. It is not a subject that on a daily basis that we discover, but on a daily basis, we experience the benefits of this subject. So from that point of view, it is interesting and intriguing every time how we can work on gamification. It's a strategic perspective that one can bring in to elicit uh, engagement and entertainment and education to your consumers. So it's, it's very, very nice. Some of the questions are very interesting. And uh, for the benefit of uh, all the other participants, I must tell you that uh, we will continue uh, the next Friday at the same time at 4 p.m. with yet another interesting guest and a very good topic. Uh, we'll see you at 4 p.m. Uh, do take care and read more about uh, gamification. Hopefully all of us have understood the difference between the gaming versus gamification and how interesting it is. There are various organizations and startups in India who are exclusively focusing on these aspects like gaming. And that is also a very interesting world. The casual gaming is even more interesting. I'm not going to talk about uh, the real money gaming. Uh, um, Rajesh has warned me not to talk about it. So I will not talk about it. Uh, but uh, see you next week uh, uh, on Friday, 4 p.m. Till then, do take care and uh, wish you all the best and happy weekend.